Uh, but it's just an introduction, there's no quiz, so don't panic. Um, but please do more questions to the end. Uh, so a bit of context here. I got interested in the GPS because of the Portland State and Other Space Society. This is the student rocketry group at Portland State University. And um, you know, we're, we're launching amateur rockets for science. Um, but uh, one of the problems we ran into is that commercial GPS receivers, you know, what like you put in your car or whatever, you know, obviously they're just not built for rockets. I don't understand this. Um, so I guess one of the things I want to say is that I am a rocket scientist, and you can too. Um, this is uh, this is you know, this is rocket science, but it's uh, it's I think accessible to rocket science. So let's see how that goes. Um, here's the, the overview of what I'm going to be covering. Um, just the fundamentals of time of flight positioning. Uh, some new stuff about how uh, GPS deals with signal versus noise. Uh, some history and politics. I think this is a particularly fascinating area of, uh, of GPS. You know how we actually got here. Um, then on to the GPS modernization efforts that are going on now. Um, some stuff about how the data layer works. And finally, this is open source bridge, so of course there is a section on open source uh, hardware and software. So I, uh, I take a deep breath a moment. And, uh, I don't know if I'm hoping my voice lasts through this talk. So fundamentals of time of flight positioning. Um, so what is GPS? GPS is a satellite-based time-of-flight positioning system. Um, some things that it is not. Uh, GPS by itself is purely passive. GPS cannot track you. But of course, your GPS receiver, uh, all bets are off, right? It could send your, your GPS track somewhere. So that's always a thing to watch out for. Uh, other things that GPS is not. GPS is not maps. Um, all GPS gives you is your position, your latitude, longitude, altitude. And it also gives you a very good idea of what time it is, uh, for reasons we'll talk a little bit about in a moment. So um, the, the key term, some of you may have heard this, is trilateration. Um, this is the, the term for, you've got these multiple satellites, and they are um, they are giving you some information about basically how far away you are from, from each satellite. And the distance from, from a given satellite describes a sphere around that satellite, right? Um, you can't tell just from that distance where you are. But if you have enough of these measurements of distance from satellites, the intersection of those spheres gives you, um, gives you your position. Uh, except that's actually kind of a lie. Uh, the satellites do not tell you how far you are from them. What the satellites tell you is the time now is uh, 1703.59 GMT, right? Um, and uh, by the time that that signal reaches you from that satellite, uh, it's, it's a little while later because of the speed of light. Delay. So, uh, so if the satellite was only 20,000 kilometers away, that's, uh, that's been delayed by 67 milliseconds. So you see, uh, at a given time, you see signals from multiple satellites that they were all transmitted simultaneously, but you've received them with different timestamps in them. And based on that difference of the timestamps, that tells you uh, something about where you are. Uh, an interesting side note, um, GPS also gives you an independent estimate of your velocity, and that's based not on these time of flight measurements, but based purely on the, the Doppler effect um, of, uh, of this the, uh, carrier signal that's uh, being sent from the satellites. So that winds up being useful for a variety of reasons that I won't unfortunately have time to get into. So um, here is where the GPS satellites are going to be over the next several hours. Uh, this is based on uh, the actual uh, uh, telemetry data um, you know, for the publicly for these satellites. One thing to note is that uh, these satellites are all at a orbital altitude of about 20,000 kilometers, or as I said, 20 megameters. Um, that's, that's really far, and we'll get into how far in a, in a moment. But um, the other thing that's interesting is these are uh, traveling at 14,000 kilometers per hour. Kind of breaking the speed limit there. So, um, but the, the question comes up is how do we know where those satellites are? Like, you can't just look up there and see them. You, you can't just track them easily that way. 
Uh, so there's an interesting trick, which is that there's this network of uh, monitoring stations around the world. The, uh, the master control station in Colorado Springs uh, being a, a particularly important one, but, uh, but all over the place. And these are all uh, using just the same GPS signals that the satellites transmit normally to, um, to sort of back up, because they know where the monitoring station is, and they can look at those signals, and they can back out where the satellite must have been. So they're kind of using GPS exactly in reverse. Uh, which I think is a really cool trick. Uh, another side note here. Uh, this is, as far as I know, the only practical uh, application of the theory of relativity that we have in sort of everyday use. If you didn't take into account the theory of relativity, your GPS would not work. Um, it turns out that uh, that special relativity says that that uh, speed clock should run a little slower. General relativity says that altitude should run a little faster, or or pitch should run from our point of view. So that partially cancels, but the result is that uh, that the atomic clocks on the satellites are actually running at just slightly slower than uh, than they appear to be from the ground. Uh, okay. It might take three tough moments here. So, the nearest GPS satellite that you could possibly have at any given time, the nearest it could be, is 20,000 kilometers straight up. Um, if, it's, if it's not directly overhead, then it's even further away. So, how far is 20,000 kilometers? Well, it is half the circumference of the Earth. Thing. This, is, this is a really long way, right? Um, half a world away, literally, right? Uh, it is also over 2,000 times the height of Mount Everest. So, <laughs> imagine taking, you know, 2,200 Mount Everest, stacking them up, um, that, that gets you up to a bit. Um, but then, how much power are these GPS satellites transmitting? Well, it's 500 watts. So you imagine taking like five of these 100 watt light bulbs and just hanging them up there at 20,000 kilometers. So 500 watts, after it's propagated over 20,000 kilometers, it's lost 18 orders of magnitude in its signal strength. And when you get down to that level of power, all the random electrical noises, you know, radio noises that are, that are just around us all the time, um, both natural and artificially generated, those are just absolutely swapping the signal. If you look at a spectrum analyzer, you cannot see the GPS signals uh, from it. So, uh, and, and making things even worse, all of these satellites are transmitting at the same frequency. So, how could this ever possibly work? And the answer is through the magic of direct sequence spread spectrum. So let's imagine that, that your signal, this is a, a bit oversimplified, but your signal is just a pure sine wave. The, the, the signal of the GPS satellite really wanted to transmit is just a pure sine wave. Um, from, uh, from signal processing theory, we, we look at this from the frequency perspective, and we say that all of the power of that signal is at one frequency, which happens to be about 1.6 gigahertz. And now let's uh, let's carefully select a pseudo random sequence of, uh, of positive ones and negative ones. I happen to like this one. This is uh, the uh, PRN one uh, gold code used by, by one of the GPS satellites. Um, so we, we've carefully selected the sequence, and there's a bunch of properties it has to satisfy, which I won't go into. Um, and now, what do we do with that sequence? Well, you can. Pointwise multiply this, uh, it's called a spreading code, the pseudo random sequence, the spreading code by the signal that you actually wanted to send. And the effect that that has is that instead of having just one big spike of power at your center frequency, you've taken all of that power and you've spread it out over a range of frequencies, which is why this is called spread spectrum. And yeah, you've made the problem seemingly even worse because now you've taken that power. Um, and spread it out even further below the noise form. But, uh, but an interesting thing happens. So let's first look at how do you get 
there's a thing called back when you've done this. Well, what you do is you take another copy of that same sequence of plus ones and minus ones, that same sort of random sequence, and you multiply that back through at the receiver by, by the signal that you got. And there's a bunch of tricks in making this actually work, but uh, but the, the interesting thing is that the plus ones, of course, didn't change the original signal. You know, mul multiplying something by, by positive one has no effect. And the minus ones, when you uh, multiply through by, by negative one again, that cancels the negative one that you multiplied through before, and you get your original signal back. So by just doing the exact same operation again at the receiver, um, you, uh, you take all of that spread out power and you grab it all and you tile it back up into one big spike. But what happens if you had uh, interference when the receiver got that signal? Well, if, if you imagine the interference being uh, just one spike of power, you've just done the same thing that you did to the original spike of power you actually wanted. So that interfering signal gets spread out. Well, at the same time, you're taking the signal you actually wanted and powering it back up. So interference gets, uh, gets spread out and you can, you can filter it away while the signal you actually wanted is, is brought back into, uh, into the realm where you can see it again on that power. So this is, this is absolutely magic, very simple, and uh, at the same time, um, and it has the effect that, uh, that accidental interference is really you know, like this, uh, the, the chance of randomly having something match this uh, given spreading code, very small. Um, and it makes intentional jamming harder. Not impossible, but, um, but it's, you, you, know, you have to work harder to, to jam a signal like, like a GPS. Um, in fact, that property of, uh, of direct spread spectrum, the military, US military uses for their anti-spoofing mode, uh, where they use a secret spreading code that we the civilians don't get to know. Um, and, and that's how they, uh, they deal with, um, with people who are trying to jam U.S. military use of GPS. So on the subject of U.S. military, let's talk about how we got the GPS system. Um, there's, there's been a long history of uh, military influence on, uh, on position. And uh, I want to just note that, that little time synchronization has turned out to kind of come along for the line. So we'll see that a few different times here. Um, first of all, let's look at 1707. The British Navy has just suffered a, a, a rather unhappy defeat. Um, and they're on their way back home. Um, and uh, to just add insult to injury in the, uh, or more injury to injury, I guess, in the uh, bad weather that they encountered, they kind of got a little lost. And so they thought they were going around an island at the south of the uh, English Channel. They were actually going around an island at the north of the English Channel. And uh, they, they wound up losing four ships out of the fleet. Uh, 1,400 sailors died. And the newspapers at the time reported that the reason for this was that they didn't know what longitude they were at. At the time, it was well understood how to find your latitude, but longitude was a much harder problem. So that led to, seven years later, the longitude prize being established. There's controversy now over whether it was actually a problem with longitude. If you look at the map, it doesn't actually make much sense. But, um, but they believed it at the time, and that was good enough to, uh, to lead to John Harrison uh, over the course of his life working out uh, increasingly sophisticated ways to deal with this longitude problem for, for seafaring vessels. And what was the magic trick? It was a better watch. Um, this was all about being able to know what time it is and being able to carry a, a clock that was carefully synchronized to Greenwich Mean Time uh, out to sea and have it not drift over time. So there's the first example of uh, military leading to positioning uh, innovation that also brought global time synchronization along for the ride. But let's go to something a little more modern. Like right? these days, a watch isn't very exciting. So October 1940, uh, the World War II has been going on in Europe for about a year at this point, 
and uh, the U.S. launches development of the Loran A system. Um, by uh, June 1942, so six months after Pearl Harbor, uh, they finally got these clunky things. Uh, now they got some UX issues. <laughs> <laughs> it takes uh, something like 15 minutes for someone to actually find out where they are using this hardware. Um, but this was uh, this was used all throughout World War II, and uh, I, I gather it was quite helpful to them. At the end of World War II, you know they were they were happy with this, but um, but started work on Lorraine's successor. In 1946, the project was Cyclan. 1952, they, they switched to Cytec. Um, eventually, all of this work led to Lorraine C, and uh, these are the kinds of receivers that you still find in uh, in fishing vessels up until the system was finally shut down in 2010. Um, as an interesting side note, uh, the first field tests of what became Lorad C, um, two of the, uh, the sites for it were uh, nearby here in Hillsboro and in uh, southern Oregon and Bedford uh, along with Palo Alto. So that was a long enough baseline for them to, to test the system. Um, another interesting side note, 1961 they demonstrated that they could do clock synchronization with Lorad. So once again, uh, positioning and time have been closely interlinked. Um, but before that, in 1957, the project transitioned from the Navy to the Coast Guard. And what else happened in 1957? Sputnik. Um, the USSR launched Sputnik 1, and uh, some, some researchers were, um, were looking at the radio signals that Sputnik 1 was transmitting, and it occurred to them that they could tell what Sputnik's orbit was by looking at the Doppler curve from those radio signals. And that led to, by 1964, uh, this transit system being deployed. Here's one of the uh, original uh, prototype transit satellites. And um, so transit was developed because, you know, we're, at this point we're talking about the middle of the Cold War, You've got submarines that are, are going around uh, prepared to be internet continental ballistic missile uh, mobile launch platforms. Um, and the submarines needed to stay submerged most of the time, uh, but they could come up periodically to, to observe satellites to make sure that they were still where they thought they were. Uh, later, transit also actually got used for uh, precise surveying by civilians and some other uses. But um, some limitations. Uh, Transit had five satellites in polar orbit. That was that was it, um, and that meant that at any given time you, you might be waiting several hours before you could actually see one of the satellites. Um, you needed to observe the satellite for a period of two minutes, and if you're a submarine that's surfacing in the middle of the Cold War in order to, to do uh, satellite observations, two minutes is kind of a scary long time. Um, also, the single pass accuracy was only 200 meters, which was amazing for the time, but we wouldn't tolerate it today. Uh, and the computers that they stuck on those submarines took 15 minutes to actually do all the computation after you spent that two minutes observing the, uh, the satellites. So there were some issues with this, but um, we see some influence from transit on how GPS works. I'll talk about uh, dual frequency for, for correcting ionospheric error a little later. Um, we also see the same thing of, uh, of determining the satellite orbit by just uh, just reversing the process you would normally use for position fix. And we see uh, global clock synchronization. Once again, um, you, you can get your clock set accurate to 50 microseconds from these satellites. So in 1973, uh, the Pentagon has this GPS idea. Um, and they've got the prototype Block 1 satellites launching from 1978 to 1985. Um, that wasn't really a, a usable system yet, the proof of concept. And in 1983, uh, some of you may know about this, Korean Airlines Flight 7 was shot down over the USSR because um, they thought that they were, once again, they thought they were following the correct route. They were, in fact, off course and passed into USSR airspace. Uh, in response, President Reagan announced that um, that GPS was going to be uh, made publicly available to civilians once it was ready. Um, 
And so then over the course of 1989 to 1994, the first 24 Block 2 satellites, the, uh, the first sort of real GPS satellites were launched in 1995. The constellation was declared fully operational. Um, one thing that they did at first with GPS um, for, for civilian use was they had this thing called selective availability. It was designed to make civilian receivers less accurate. Um, that was intended to prevent non-U.S. militaries from, uh, from using it for bad things. Unfortunately, it also limited usability for safety critical applications. And uh, as a result of that and the fact that technology was finding ways to work around selective availability anyway, um, selective availability was turned off in 2000, which improved civilian receiver accuracy from 100 meters down to 20 meters. So that's cool. Um, there's even more going on now. So uh, in 1998, the White House announced that we'd be doing this GPS modernization program. It took another two years before Congress actually authorized it, calling it GPS-3. Um, another eight years before the contract was actually awarded to Lockheed Martin. Um, the first Block 3 launch satellite launch is planned for this year, and that of course means that it will be at least 2016. <laughs> Um, now, here's an interesting philosophical question. Given the consequences of GPS failure, uh, and how much we depend on all of this stuff, can we trust a GPS that is operated by the U.S. military? Well, some countries have said no. Uh, Russia has launched, uh, has, has their uh, GLONASS system they're working on. The European Union is launching Galileo. Uh, someday they have the same sort of uh, scheduling issues with you. Um, China has their compass system, and there's regional systems launched by France, India, and Japan, and maybe others I'm, I'm not aware of. So um, a bunch of countries are, are all trying to sort of uh, at least make sure there are multiple sources, right? Um, as a final thought, this may not be big enough. This is the unit patch uh, that I, I gather is worn by some of the uh, personnel at the uh, Shriver Air Force Base um, in Colorado Springs. I'm a little disturbed by the war to your door <laughs> slogan. So, you know, we've had this, um, this military, this history of, of military innovation driving these systems. But really, it's, it's the civilian uses that actually make this stuff interesting. And so I want to encourage uh, you all individually to, to hack on stuff, you know, come up with, with cool things to do with GPS. Okay, that was my history section. Let's talk a little about what GPS modernization actually means. Uh, but first, let's, let's ask the question, why is it that the U.S. military GPS receivers are more accurate than our civilian ones? The answer to that is in the ionosphere. This is a layer of the atmosphere that's, that's the, the, uh, the, large, the um, uppermost layers from 85 kilometers out to like 600 kilometers. This is well above you know, where airplanes fly or anything else. Um, and uh, this, is, um, this is a layer that's strongly affected by the solar wind, <coughs> so basically space wet. So as the solar wind hits this layer, it's, um, the, the charged particles that the sun is kicking off are, uh, are ionizing the, this layer of the atmosphere, but it's in unpredictable ways. We can't actually predict space weather reliably, and, um, and so while you can get a, a rough model, the exact details of what's going on up there right now um, are something you can only measure at this point, not, not, uh, not predict. Um, so, and a GPS receiver, um, particularly a, a civilian one, can't directly measure this. So it can't compensate for it directly. That's the bad news. The good news is that the, uh, the effect that the ionosphere has on the signals from the GPS satellites depends on the frequency of the signal. And that's good news because that means that if you can use two frequencies, you can basically cancel out uh, this problem. Um, as a side note, uh, for, uh, for uh, citizen science, you know, if you have a, um, a suitable uh, hackable GPS receiver, you could at home go measure the total electron content of a given section of this, this guy above you. So, um, so that's one of the cool things that you could do just, uh, just by having GPS exist. Um, 
So yeah, GPS has two frequencies that it uses. Uh, they're called L1 and L2. L1 has, carries the civilian signal at about 1.6 gigahertz. Um, L2 carries only the military encrypted signal at 1.2 gigahertz. Um, so you know, the good news was that, that there is something you can do uh, if you have two frequencies. The better news is GPS modernization is giving us more frequencies. So that L2 frequency that currently only carries the military code um, will, once GPS modernization is done, also be carrying a new L2C civilian signal. And in addition, they're adding a third frequency, L5, uh, that will also be available to civilians. So that's great, but I'm impatient. I want better GPS now. Uh, OK, so one answer to this is uh, wide area augmentation system, or more generally, uh, satellite-based augmentation systems. Uh, you take known locations, you measure the ionospheric delays from them, you broadcast those corrections up to satellites. WAS apparently does this every five seconds. Um, and, uh, and then the satellites can, can rebroadcast out this data for, for GPS receivers to use. So that's cool. That was actually good enough for, um, for uh, aviation in the US to use GPS, I guess, as a primary, um, primary system for landing in bad weather. Um, the other interesting hack is uh, codeless, or in some cases, semi-codeless tracking. Um, this is a hack to use L2, even though we can't decrypt the signal. Uh, there's still a certain amount of information you can get out of it. Um, although GPS modernization, the US uh, government has announced, may break existing codeless receivers, uh, they've promised not to do this before 2020. Um, so that's, that's a thing to keep in mind if you wanted to play with that. Come on schedule. It's cool. All right. So let's talk about the data layer. So far I've talked about what kinds of signals the satellites are sending. But there's a little more to, to those signals than what I've told you so far. So let's come back to trilateration for a moment. Um, you know, I, I said that um, that the satellite is telling you uh, telling you what time it was and the time that it transmitted. Um, but that doesn't actually do any good unless you know where the satellite was when it transmitted. So you have to somehow find out what the orbits of these satellites are. So GPS has what they call a navigation message. This is a 50 bit per second, not megabit, not kilobit, 50 bit per second uh, signal. It's super slow. It takes 30 seconds to send one complete frame of the GPS navigation message. Um, so there's, there's this challenge for a receiver. Uh, in order to actually lock onto one of the satellites, you have to know which spread spectrum code you're going to look for. There's a different one for each satellite. And how can you guess which ones you should be looking for if you don't know where you are and you don't know where the satellites are? Well, one thing you can do is just sort of try random. Just keep trying different, uh, different spreading codes until you find one. But as long as you've found one satellite, then uh, GPS provides what they call the almanac. Uh, this is the approximate orbital uh, parameters for all of the satellites. So that's cool. Once you find one satellite, you can find the rest of them, right? Well, uh, it actually only rotates through one or two satellites every 30 seconds. So in order to get all of the satellites, you need to wait 12 and a half minutes. That's called a cold start in, uh, in this terminology. So here's a better plan that we can do today. Just try all the satellites at once. There's this, this hack using fast Fourier transforms <coughs> that uh, it's compute intensive, but we can do lots of fast Fourier transforms in very little time today. So, uh, so we can just do this and uh, find all the middle visible satellites in less than like a tenth of a second. So that's cool. Uh, all right, now I know which satellites are visible. Now what? Well, I still need to know there's their precise orbits. Um, even if I got the almanac, it's it's uh, not precise enough to do very good uh, positioning. So uh, the ephemeris or plural ephemerides 
um, is uh, is data that uh, that the satellites each satellite transmits. Um, it's detailed orbital parameters, but um, but each satellite only sends its own orbital uh, parameters. Um, unlike the Almanac, where each satellite is sending all of the, the satellite's uh, parameters eventually. Uh, but the ephemeris is sent every 30 seconds, which means that um, it takes between 18 and 48 seconds to get your complete set of, of ephemerides for the satellites you're currently looking at, um, as long as you're, you're listening to them all in parallel. That's called a warm start. Um, you can maybe do even better. I mean, 48 seconds is still a long time, right? You don't want to wait that long on your phone. So uh, a hot start is if you already have current ephemerides, you already had a pretty good idea of what time it is. It doesn't have to be perfect, but, uh, but pretty good. And you kind of know roughly what your position is, within, say, maybe 100 kilometers. So it doesn't have to be too precise. But given that, uh, lock and position fix should take less than a second. So how can we get there? Um, because, you know, I'm impatient. Uh, well, assisted GPS is one of the major ways. Um, you can, if you have some high-speed network connection, instead of waiting for that 50 bit per second downlink from the satellite to get you the ephemerides, you can just ask the, the internet, you know, what, what should I be seeing right now? Um, your cell phone almost certainly does this. Uh, in fact, your phone might not even support getting a GPS slot at all if it doesn't have network assistance. That depends on the phone. Um, particularly the uh, low-cost, low-power ones will will uh, cheap out on this a bit. Um, and uh, when you're in this assisted GPS setting, you have a number of shortcuts you can take. Um, you often have a pretty good source of time from the network, either from the cell phone network or just you know using NTP. Um, so that's one of those requirements for hot start, right? Um, phones often can also get uh, a, you know approximate location from just looking at what cell tower. So that's another of those requirements for hot start. And then together with having the, the internet connection to pull down the ephemerides, you're gold. Okay, maybe maybe I'm actually patient, but I am picky. I want a very accurate GPS fix. So here's a problem with the ephemerides that you get from the satellites. They are a best guess forecast. Um, there's that solar wind that's uh, causing unpredictable um, uh, ionospheric delays is also causing the satellite's orbits to change. And there's lots of other things that are causing the satellite's orbits to change. And we can't predict all of them. So um, once a day, uh, Colorado Springs uploads, uh, uploads current forecasts for what they believe the satellite's orbits will be based on all the data they have so far. Um, and then once per week, the control segment reports what the satellite's orbits actually were over the last week, and you can uh, there's a website somewhere I forget where that uh, that you can just go fetch all this uh, all these ephemerides for going back for years. So this gives an option for surveyors, for instance, people who or, or scientists for that matter, people who really care about exactly where their GPS receiver was. Um, they don't need a quick answer, but they do need an accurate one. So. What you can do is you can have your receiver recording data for, say, 24 hours, which lets you average out a bunch of the, the sources of error. And then a week later, you can grab these precise ephemerides from, from just the web and go back and, and look at all your raw data and say, well, if the satellites were actually here, then this is what these, these measurements mean. There's some other stuff in the navigation message. Uh, there's clock corrections, because even atomic clocks drift, and it does matter. Um, there's information about whether you can actually trust uh, all the different satellites right now. Uh, there's a general atmospheric model which gives you some corrections, even though it's, it's not as accurate as you might like. And there's information about things like uh, how many things there are in UTC right now. Um, and uh, as a final note on this section, GPS modernization changes the encoding details, but the big picture of, of what's in the uh, the new L2C signals and L5 signals is, is all basically the same. So the uh, really cool part of the talk. Here we are at Open Source Bridge. Where's the openness in all this? 
Well, the good news is uh, GPS operation is, is really well documented by the U.S. government, and there's lots of publicly available sources. There are, there are very good books, um, very detailed books on exactly how all of this works. The bad news is that uh, GPS receiver hardware is the worst kind of proprietary. Uh, you, um, you can only get documentation for most of this stuff if both you pay a lot of money and you sign an NDA. Which means that uh, that if we want to do anything open with uh, with our GPS receivers, either we can't find out how to do it, or we can't tell anyone how we did it. So, do we even need their hardware? Uh, in 1991, this random ham radio enthusiast uh, built his own GPS and GLONASS receivers. Uh, okay, sure, he's now an electrical engineer, an engineering professor, he's the head of a, the Laboratory for Radiation and Optics at this university whose name I can't pronounce in Slovenia. So, you know, this is not just you know, a random person walking off the street doing this, but it demonstrates that you don't need a military budget to do it. And you didn't need it in 1991, right? He was using Motorola 68K CPUs, um, and digital signal processors and custom discrete electronics. This is uh, this is hobbyist level stuff in 1991, right? Um, Twenty years later, uh, there's Andrew Holmes, uh, homebrew GPS receivers, and he was doing this stuff uh, with again he had some custom discrete electronics and he used an FPGA and a Raspberry Pi. So absolutely within the realm of stuff that. Uh, that you know, hobbyists can do today. Um, there have been other open projects. Um, I want to particularly call out uh, Clifford Kelly's open source GPS, and which inspired uh, Andrew Greenberg's uh, GPL GPS. Andrew is one of the founders of the Portland State Aerospace Society, and has a lot to do with why I'm uh, interested in this in the first place. Um, they were both using uh, Zarlink ships, which were uh, at the time one of the only available. Uh, receiver chips that you could actually get uh, freely available documentation for. Uh, unfortunately, you can't buy those chips anymore, so uh, that's that. Our current thing, and I want to thank Jenner for doing a lot of the work on this, uh, is the Portland State Aerospace Society GPS RF funding. I have this board with me. Um, I believe it's the only prototype we have, so I'm not actually going to pass it around. But um, but this board is just, you plug an antenna in one end, you plug a, maybe a USB cable in the other end, and it's basically a, uh, a fancy analog to digital converter. Uh, it does a little more than that because you want to take data from 1.6 gigahertz down to a frequency you can actually deal with, um, and that turns out to be complicated. But, um, but that's all done by, I believe, this uh, little chip in the, the corner, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, uh, so this is going to be really cool, uh, assuming it works. We don't actually have quite talking to us successfully yet. Um, so what can you do with that, assuming it works? Well, one thing you can do is maybe stream the, the data into a Beagle board and, um, and do all your, your computation, all the, uh, the GPS satellite tracking using the digital signal processor core, you know, M3. Uh, or maybe you could stream it into an FPGA if you feel like using a, a uh, Harvard description language to describe how to, how to do GPS. Um, or you can just stream it into a PC over USB and do everything in software, which is what I want to do because uh, that other stuff sounds hard. Um, <laughs> or uh, this one I'm really excited about, you can stick this thing on a rocket and uh, log the, uh, the data that, that, that you're receiving from the GPS satellites over the course of a rocket flight, which we uh, you know, hopefully will be doing July 20th. So, um, so that will be a very interesting, as far as I know, that will be the first, uh, first publicly available data set um, of you know, what it looks like to be a GPS receiver on a rocket. Okay, how hard is this stuff, really? Um, I mean, it kind of is rocket science, uh, but you can totally learn it. I have no background in electrical engineering, no background in digital signal processing or radio. Um, basically, I read a lot of Wikipedia articles and have some, some good people around helping. Um, so this is totally feasible. There's there's a lot of uh, a lot of levels you can work at, um, but uh, and, you know definitely talk to me. Um, 
I was hoping I had a little more time for the questions. Uh, so let's do the summary quickly. Um, in brief, one more time, uh, it's about uh, GPS about finding your position by trilateration from signals from satellites. Uh, things that GPS does not do include maps and surveillance, so you have to add those at a higher layer. Um, some amazing science results. Uh, you know, confirmation of the theory of relativity in something that we use every day. And um, and also a method, a method that you can at home, at least if you have a hackable receiver, which you probably don't, um, you can measure uh, things like the ionosphere's total electron content. And you know, just citizen science kind of stuff you can do. Uh, some amazing engineering results. The fact that we can actually get those signals that are basically uh, invisible by the time they get here. The fact that you can you can see those signals at all, uh, thanks to direct signal spread spectrum. Um, and you know, keeping in mind that positioning is still evolving. You know, there's the GPS modernization efforts. There's other countries working on their own systems. Um, and I just want to emphasize again: the military created GPS, but we are the ones who make it awesome. So. You know, do what you can. Um, one thing that you can do is, if you're here in town is come play with the Portland State Aerospace Society. Uh, maybe come see our next launch, July 20th. Um, there's the, the URL for this talk as well as for, for our group's website. And uh, I have, I think, three minutes for questions. <laughs> so um, you mentioned that the commercial solution doesn't work in the rocket. Where, where does it break down? What is it not acquiring? Um, correctly, or there's actually a number of reasons. Um, uh, one is um, international traffic and arms regulations restrictions um, that cause, even though the receiver may know where it is, it may not be allowed to really tell you. Um, designed to prevent it from being used on this. Okay. Uh, another is that um, the traffic loops are, are designed assuming that you will have a low dynamic environment, so you're not moving very fast. You know, maybe you're moving as fast as an airplane. We go past Mach 1, one uh, things start breaking down at that point. So, it also assumes you're moving really fast straight up, which is really yeah. unlikely for anything. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's a number of, of subtle issues, um, and basically we need to be able to hack the receiver in order to, to get things to work reliably. Two things. One is, are people doing the total electron count thing with it? Uh, not that, that I know of, but I saw references to it, so uh, maybe some of them. That would be really cool. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, if anybody wants to look at the hardware, we have the hardware in um, our software that's... Yeah, I did bring this prototype. So, the, but the, the GitHub, if you go to github.io um, slash psas slash gps dash rf dash board, it gets you there. Or if you probably just Google at this point, the SAS GPS board. Sure. Uh, there was a yeah, I was wondering, um, so you can get these really cheap software defined radio helium. Uh huh. Um, and assuming you can throw gigahertz and gigahertz of computing, would you be able to do GPS with just that? Because they can still so even that. The question is whether um, things like the uh, those uh, USB TV tuners, and yeah, those other things that people are doing software defined radio with, uh, are good enough for this. Um, I think some people have done GPS with those TV tuners. Uh, they've definitely done them with the, you know, the Edis Research uh, Universal Software Radio Peripheral. Um, we wanted something custom because uh, we need something small, low power, and light. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, there is existing stuff that you can use. There's, this is not the only option. So There's also some RF issues you can have to go a little bit of customization mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you said that there was the, the ionization measurements that you could do. If a bunch of them were, were a bunch of different people were doing the ionization measurements like across the country, across the globe, could we get more accurate GPS readings? So if you have uh, a bunch of people doing ionization and you know, ionosphere uh, measurements across the country, across the globe, um, yes, uh, yes you could get more, more accurate GPS readings and you could share those. Which is what that uh, wide area augmentation system does in the other satellite based augmentation <laughs> systems. It turns out you don't actually need that many uh, measurement points. So I think there's like three or four in the US that are, that are observing this, and that's apparently enough for, uh, for really good results. 
Uh, you mentioned LRAM, yeah. I mean, let's see. So uh, what did that use for navigation? Did, did it use satellites or ground-based or what? I meant to mention, yes, LRAM, both LRAM A and LRAM C were ground-based systems. So they had transmitters in a variety of uh, positions on the ground, um, preferably fairly far separated. And then by listening to the signals from two of those transmitters at once, you could get, well, you actually sort of needed four, I think, uh, to get a full full position. But um, yeah, that was that was how they worked. You'll find the big old towers on the coast. There's they they didn't take them all down when they decommissioned these. Yeah, these were like three hundred meter tall towers. Yeah, yeah, it was all <laughs> HF and LF stuff. It was all really little well green. I mean, you, you didn't you knew that they all were exactly. So yeah, you, you had to know, know where the towers were. And absolutely. also, they had a lot more power. Yeah, oh yeah, they were crazy. Um, I just want to ask. I, I came in a different place, so you might have heard. But like the the spherical trilateration mm -hmm. thing that's done, that gives a three-dimensional point or like ball of certainty or just like you want to do? So, um, so you actually wind up needing uh, four satellites to do trilateration with GPS, uh, which gives you four variables, uh, which you can think of as latitude, longitude, and altitude, and time, uh, which is an interesting, interesting quirk of the system. Uh, can you do something like a uh, LoRaN using this technology to have like an open source LoRaN? I don't see why you wouldn't do an open source LoRaN, but it'd be a huge investment. Um, as, as I mentioned, the uh, the towers for that were a well, little meters tall. And probably you know, well, I meant for like a localized thing, for like inside this room, like where are you located? Oh. Uh, sure, you can use uh, these same principles on a smaller scale uh, to do you know, interim positioning. There's uh, actually a uh, company in the Portland State Business Accelerator that's trying to do that right now. Um, so there, there's all sorts of things you can do uh, based on these investments. I think I'm uh, over time. I'm happy to keep chatting with people to the extent you want to Thank you all.